So God can use people, places, things, or thoughts. Mm -hmm. So it will vary from time to time what he uses to bring you a new level of his presence during difficult times. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Dr. Tony Evans is one of the most respected leaders in the evangelical community. He is a pastor, teacher, author, husband, father, and unapologetic Christian. After starting Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship with just a few people, he now has one of the biggest voices in Christianity. His radio broadcast, The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, can be heard on over 1,400 radio outlets daily and in more than 130 countries. Dr. Evans' sermons are also streamed and downloaded over 20 million times annually. On a personal note, I am a tremendous fan of Dr. Evans and listen to his sermons on Sundays. In this episode, Troy challenged me to ask Tony the hardest faith-based questions I could think of. This was not meant to be offensive, but rather to hear how someone with his expertise would respond to different scenarios and criticisms. I ask you to go into today's episode with an open mind, heart, and soul. Whether you share his faith or not, Dr. Evans' authenticity, conviction, and dedication are admirable. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Dr. Tony Evans, it is an unbelievable pleasure to have you join us today. Unbelievable because you have been such an enormous part of my life for the past three years. I watch you every Sunday before attending the church just down the road at your suggestion. Also at your suggestion in order not to be a secret agent Christian, I witness in every podcast that I draw what strength I have since I was diagnosed with ALS from Jesus. Well, I'm so glad to be with you. Thank you for giving me the privilege and the opportunity. Every tape, every radio broadcast, every sermon is because that man rubbed off on us. Is what you said about your father in a recent sermon, eulogizing him. Those are some powerful words, especially considering you are a best-selling author and your sermons are heard in over 140 countries and by more than 1 million people a week. I also know that your father was born again when you were 11 years old. So my question to you is this, did you ever have the typical rebellious phase most kids go through, maybe as a teenager? You know, I went through my, um, I, I had some teenage years of, of, it wasn't like crazy rebellion, but it was um, just apathy. I would say it was apathy. And, um, uh, but then when I was 18, that's when I got like really fired up about uh, uh, my faith and about serving the Lord. So, so more apathy, because I was more in the sports. And, and uh, so that took up my, all of my attention. But when I was 18, that's when I, I really got all in. Dr. Evans, what happened at 18 that, that made that switch flip for you? Our church was involved in an evangelistic crusade. And um, the evangelist on the opening night didn't speak about coming to Christ. He was challenging Christians to be all in for Christ. And that meeting stirred me up to kind of dedicate myself to get all in. 
did you talk to your parents after that after that kind of challenge was made and you did you kind of establish it or did you i guess proclaim it or did you it was, just lead with actions well it was it was kind of a combination they heard it and saw it and so they kind of uh uh saw me getting into the word a lot and talking asking questions so it was kind of self evident you say the bible is the literal word of god then how do you reconcile paul's writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35, where it says, Let your woman keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for woman to speak in church. How do you reconcile that with the women in your life? Your late wife, who I understand was a vocal partner in the creation of your own church, and your daughter, who has preached in churches herself. Well, they were the, in in the uh, church at Corinth. They were they were uh, undergoing their first century uh, feminism movement, <laughs> and their feminism movement had women operating out of covenantal order. So they were bypassing their husbands and exercising independent authority in the church. That's why in 1 Corinthians 11, he says a woman can pray and prophesy if she's covered. So in 1 Corinthians 11, she is speaking because you can't prophesy with silence. But in verse in 1 Corinthians 14, he talks about the order in which it is done. So you have two realities. They were operating out of order. If it was in order, that is under the covenantal order of God, which 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 is what the Bible calls for in First Timothy chapter uh, uh, three, then it would be being done orderly. But they were out of order, even with regard to their own husbands and how they were operating in the church. Are there any other parts like that? I guess. That part seems like you have a pretty good answer for, and I assume you get a lot of questions like that. But are there any parts of the Bible that you do read and, and you question, you know, it seems whether it seems inconsistent or it's hard for you to wrap your head around? Well, some, even Peter said some of Paul's writings are difficult to interpret. So some portions of Scripture take more work to understand, to interpret uh, than other parts of Scripture. But at the same time, how you frame it, the umbrella that you have over Scripture helps you to interpret it better. For example, many times people interpret passages that are written for Christians as though they're written for non-Christians, which confuses it. Like James says, faith without works is dead. But Paul says people are saved by faith apart from works. Well, that sounds like a contradiction until you understand he's referring to two different audiences. He's telling non-Christians how to become Christians. He's telling Christians how to function as Christians. So that's where knowing the context of a particular passage helps you to interpret it, even if it's difficult. Do you think that that misconception, it seems like um, I was reading this book recently about this, where it's, I think public, the society thinks that maybe religion is, trending down downwards in terms of uh, popularity, but actually from a world perspective, it's actually increasing. It seems like there's a lot of misconceptions out there and, and maybe it is from people reading. A lot of people read the same passage and have three different, four different, five different understandings of what it means, right? Is there, how do you, as somebody um, like yourself, who's such a powerful voice um, for Christianity, is there something you can do or is there something you would suggest to people to, to look towards to try and cut through um, all the other interpretations? Well, you can get the Tony Evans Bible commentary and that'll save you a lot of time. No, <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> well, you know, um, there, you know, there are these systems of theology, Calvinism and Arminianism and these systems of theology, which affects interpretation. So you're right. People can come to various passages but when you understand that God makes a difference between entering the kingdom, getting saved, and operating underneath the kingdom, which is discipleship, 
when those two things are clearly distinguished, a lot of the Bible falls in place. Uh, one book I recommend is a book called uh, Final Destiny by a man named Jody Dillo. And the book Final Destiny goes into all of these differences, but then it explains it's a very thick book, but it goes into all of the uh, uh, the major passages where there is confusion to bring about that difference, which brings understanding to a lot of this confusion. Yeah, it's really interesting. I wrote the name down. I wrote yeah. the book down. Dr. Evans, I have been what you call a secret agent Christian most of my life. I was baptized and confirmed in the Methodist church, and I accepted Jesus as my personal savior. But I was a slacker. I would occasionally publicly acknowledge God for the blessed life that I had, and I also made the themes in my kids' novels both kindness and forgiveness. I understand now, thanks to people like you, the mission I was meant for. My question is this. When I was first diagnosed, I was suicidal. My doctor prescribed me anti-anxiety medicine, which helped me tremendously. Was this a gift from God as I see it, or was it an unnecessary crutch, which makes me only a little better than an addict? Well, if you're asking me, is... You're talking about the medication to help you cope? Yeah. Well, God uses medicine. God talks about being a physician. He talks about being a healer. One of the writers in the Bible, Luke, was a physician. So, um, so medical science is a legitimate help to our well-being as long as it does not become the source, but merely a resource. Only God is our source, but he uses various resources. He uses banks to protect our money. He uses uh, uh, people who have various skills to help us build our houses. So using resources, God does all the time, and those resources help us to deal with the various realities of life. So I would say that what he gave that helped you in light of what you were having to deal with was a blessing in the midst of a difficult situation. <laughs> it's so great hearing. I'm used to hearing your voice on his uh, phone playing it out loud. It's so funny hearing you guys have a conversation because I, I uh, like I said, every Sunday we I hear you on his phone playing out loud. So it's, it's, it's hilarious to hear you responding to his questions. I just had like a, like a, um, I don't know, like a, a nostalgic kind of moment there. It's really cool. All right, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I cut you off. Let's say you have a future grandson who comes to you and says, Gramps, I have no interest in girls, but I am physically attracted to boys. What would you say to him? Well, what I would say, because, you know, we have to deal with this all the time now, especially in, in the world that we live in now, where it's being promoted. Um, I would always start with God's standard that he created the male and female. Okay, So there are only two genders. Okay, But sin can create dysphoria. Sin can create uh, feelings that are antithetical to God's word. Okay. When we have feelings that are antithetical, even when they are so inbred to our being, uh, we have to start with the truth because God only is obligated to his truth. You are a male. You have uh, feelings that are not consistent with your creation. So while we do not want to force you in a direction that is not natural for your feelings, we do not want you to yield to your feelings either. So what we want to do is a process of inner spiritual healing with God and see how he redirects the wiring emotionally from that, whether or not he gives you new wiring for the other. A lot of times what we what people do is try to force a kid to go in a direction they're not ready to go in yet, rather than focusing on them not going in the direction they shouldn't go in, because that puts them in a dual tension. So we will focus in one direction 
So if I can get them to accept that what God says, then we can begin to work on bringing that under spiritual authority and let the natural process take you in another direction when you are ready. Do you think in in, uh, kind of modern society you referenced a little bit ago where it is being promoted, things like sexuality and and transgenderism, things like that, do you think that's a... I mean, is that going to be a direct, I guess, not competition, but um, basically a a conflict with the church? You think that'll that'll have a negative impact on religion? Well, I think it is already having a negative impact because of cancel culture. And what cancel culture is doing is is trying to force Christianity into the mold of accepting what the culture has accepted. And many churches are acquiescing to it whether it's gay marriage, whether it's uh, accepting transgenderism as normative. And so many are, 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 are acquiescing, but there are many that are not as well. So I think the church is in a critical moment of deciding uh, whether we're going to be Christ's church or the culture's church. And what do you think, I mean, how does that, how does that end? Do you think it, the, the church is almost split into two different camps where there's the, like you just said, the, the Christ church and the culture church? Well, I think one of two things is happening. Either we're set for Christ's return, and that's why we're having this decline, or we're set for a, 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 um, a renewal of some sort because things have gotten so bad that it will force the church to make the right decision for God. So we have to see which which of those two things are happening, but I think one of those two things is on the table right now. Do you think that we are in the end times? Well, that's part of the question. Paul, well, the, the, the biblical writers tell us to always think we're in the end times in how we function, whether or not we're in the end times or not. We don't know the day or the hour that that all of this is going to come. All the signs would say we are in the end times, but we just can't prove that. So we are to function like we're not in the end times, but believe like we are in the end times. Why do you think that, uh, why do you think just so everybody's acting like that, so they're on their... I guess, on their A game in terms of religion wise. Why, is that why you think it's said to always act like it's the end times? Well, yeah, because apostasy, people drifting from the faith. So we got to fight like we're at the last, you know, the last two minutes of the game, you know, <laughs> the end times. OK, we got to fight like that, even though we may have to go to overtime. I just thought I'd throw a little football in there. That's all. No, that's perfect. That's perfect. That's, that's, I definitely, uh, I'm, I am, um, you're, you know, you're, you're the doctorate in in religion. My dad's, uh, very, very, uh, well versed in it. I'm, I'm not yet. I'm kind of on a, uh, a personal crusade, I guess. So I'm still learning. Any football references you can make for me will help me a lot. (laughs) Okay. So, so if the game, if we're in the, let's keep the, the, the uh, reference going, the analogy going, if we're in the final two minutes here and we might go to overtime, I mean, are you worried? Are you more worried about trying to bring more people on your team and, and get more people to your, you know, your views of, of like the, you said, like Christ church versus the culture church? Or do you think it's, it's less important about the number of people and more important just staying true to what you believe? Well, I don't think you have to distinguish between the two. I think you can go both for both at the same time. We're trying to get people to become kingdom disciples who function as kingdom servants in order to make a kingdom impact. And that means bringing people to Christ, discipling them in the faith, and then unleashing them to multiply numbers, but to go deeper with them so that they become servants just like, you know, Jesus started with 12 and then there was 70 and then there's 120 in the upper room and then 3,000 get saved and 5,000 get saved. So there's this multiplication as you go deeper. It just, it feels like there's a, and maybe it's just the culture and what what's the, maybe it's the minority speaking loud for the majority, right? On like social media and stuff like that. Cancel culture. It seems like there's a, there's a real, not war, but odds right now, like you said, with kind of, the culture of especially the youth and with 
and with, um, I'd say, more traditional um, Christian faith, like somebody like yourself, I know you worried at all about losing that, you know, having a, um, the youth kind of turn away at, because a lot of people I think would say, well, if, if the church isn't okay with people being gay, then that's not a church I want to go to or something like that. Are you, would you be worried about that and try and convince them to, to come to your side or is it more just, I don't know. Well, I don't know. That's a question. well, here's the problem. The Bible says to use a football illustration again, <laughs> you know, the, the way you have uh, field goals is you got the ball going through the uprights. So you got two uprights, right? And the Bible says that we are to speak the truth in love. Some groups emphasize love at the expense of truth. Other groups emphasize truth at the expense of love. What our young people need to see is truth being made known with love. Sometimes if you just are against the sin of homosexuality, you can present it in an unloving way that doesn't care about people, that doesn't reflect the fact that we're all sinners, and that doesn't care for and work with people. The other side is you love them, so you accept whatever they do. Both sides, uh, you lose an upright, which means you can't have a field goal. So you got to have, according to Ephesians 4, truth and love in order to have a balanced approach to people. And I think when people see the two of them working together, it makes Christianity more palatable. What if a grieving mother comes to you and says, I'm a Christian, but I cannot believe in a God who let my four-year-old child get sick, suffer for a year, and ultimately die? What would you say to her? Well, I have to say a couple of things. First of all, I have to... Uh, uh, be compassionate with her loss so that she knows that I know she is hurting and that I don't just want to spit out spiritual answers that do not try to relate to her pain. So I want to start with compassion. Second thing is I want to assure her where her child is, that at four years old, they are with the Lord. And so I want to give her that assurance. Now, as to the question of why that happened, we cannot give specific answers to why specific things happen. We know that sin has created a curse and that curse has brought uh, negative repercussions in our world and in our lives. But we also have to know God is sovereign and in control. So that if he allowed that to happen, even when he has not explained the why, we have to trust the who. We have to trust the God who knows things we do not know when he does things we do not like. I would give my own personal experiences of loss, of things we did not like. I will show them from the Bible, people who question God. Whether it's Job, why do the righteous suffer? Whether it's Habakkuk, how long, O oh Lord, how long? So even the strongest of Christians had questions. And I would tell her this. It's okay to ask God questions. It's not okay to question God. And those are two different things. To ask God questions because you don't understand and to fight through the feelings of doubt, frustration, anger is legitimate. As long as we recognize he is God and has some things that he has not explained. Or Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that God has things that he does not explain. Do you ever have moments where you quite not question God, but ask God questions that you don't understand that are going on? Absolutely. In life? Even when I lost my wife, Lois, I had questions that I didn't understand at that specific time. We lost eight people within two years. Uh, uh, just recently, my 19-year-old uh, 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 great nephew hit a car, severed his, severed his spinal cord, and died a few hours later. As I'm talking to you now, my kids are at their funeral. Is that the, uh, they're at the funeral? We don't understand that. Why would that happen at 19, right in the prime of his life? And we can't answer why. But the beautiful thing is that we had a shared faith 
that says we're going to trust God even with the question marks. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. And when you when you have those moments of I don't know if you'd call them moments of weakness or moments of, of wonder, of question, doubt, whatever, whatever that would be. Um, you know, how do you handle it? If somebody who's listening to this has a moment in their life or a difficulty difficulty in their life that they're not sure what to make of it, I mean, what would you do? What what did you literally do? Well, you know, there's certain passages really resonate during that time. Second uh, Corinthians chapter one, the God of all comfort, verses three through eleven. Uh, um, you know, obviously the book of Job, the book of Habakkuk, uh, um, are things that you read. Um, the last chapter of Genesis, where uh, Joseph says, "You meant it for evil; God meant it for good to bring me to this place." Uh, so, l- reading scriptures. Uh, praying, meditating, and and asking God to reveal himself at a deeper level. So let me see more of you, even if you don't answer my questions. Yes, I'd like for you to answer my questions, but if you don't, sure. let me experience more of you. What What do you, if you don't mind me asking, I know it's a very personal thing, so if you don't have to answer if it's too personal, but... When you have those moments and you ask I me, mean, what do you feel? What what sensations do you feel like when you ask God to reveal Himself about whether it's your your great nephew or or your wife or whoever? I mean, what what kind of things? What kind of signs or feelings do you get? Well, it can vary depends on the situation, but sometimes it's an encouraging word from somebody else that I hear, or a message from somebody else that I hear. Or it's uh, uh, that's why the fellowship of God's people is critical to be surrounded by that. I had a friend who uh, lost his wife and then I'd lost my wife just prior to his wife. And so I called him and he felt he told me that my call to him gave him the encouragement to handle what he was doing. So God can use people, places, things or thoughts. Mm -hmm. So it will vary from time to time what he uses to bring you a new level of his presence during difficult times. Can you tell people the story about how you founded your church? Well, I was finishing my master's degree at Dallas Seminary when we decided to go on for my doctorate, but we wanted to do ministry at the same time. So my wife, Lois, and I started a Bible study in our house with about 10 people. And so I'm working on my doctorate. We started a Bible study and the Bible study grew. So as the Bible study continued to grow grow, while I was doing my studies uh, in June of 76, we decided to launch it into a church that was not my original plan, but God has curveballs. So so he called it audible. (laughs) (laughs) How quickly did it go from those 10 people to, I don't know, a hundred, a thousand, 10,000. Now, obviously there's millions oh, wow. of people listen to you. Well, I would say, um, after a year, it was at probably 75 people. After three years, it's probably at 200 people after five years. So just exponential growth. And then as we got bigger facilities, it grew more. Was there anything that happened during that timeline? Was it always kind of a steady climb? Or did, did you have any moment that maybe something happened and all of a sudden the popularity really spiked? Well, I think exposure to media always gives you broader exposure and therefore more people know, hear, and come. So sending tapes out, exposure to media, and that, of course, gave birth to the Urban Alternative in 1981 where we got on radio. Was there anything different about when it was just you and, and the 10 people in the house? Like, did you did you do anything? Did you preach any different than you do now with millions of people? Well, uh, I've always done expository preaching, but it, 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 so I'm, it's pretty consistent with what I've always done. It's just now you got microphone and sound systems and stuff. So, sure. <laughs> so that changes it, but, but pretty consistent. When you were, when you were on that journey of growing it, did you, did you enjoy, and I guess still to this day, do you enjoy the growth of the numbers going up or is it, is it no different to you, whether it's 10 people or a million people? 
Oh, yeah, I try not to make that a difference. That's not because I speak to small groups, big groups, medium sized groups. So that that's not critical. The size. It's the significance, not the size. How can you be certain that the Bible is divinely inspired and not twisted by men over the years to suit their own desires? The same way I can be convinced that Jesus is uh, the perfect son of God. The Holy Spirit oversaw the process of the conception, the birth, and the life of Jesus Christ. So what happened with the living word, the Spirit also did with the written word. He oversaw it coming into fruition and being um, recorded in inspiration. And the reason I'm confident in it is because of all the prophecies that were predicted over time that came through precisely. So that lets me know that the word can be trusted. So we have a trustworthy word. And just as God kept sin from entering into Jesus, he kept sin from entering into his word. What are some of the prophecies, or I guess, what are some of the things that make you feel so confident about that, just like you, you were kind of going down that path? Well, the prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament came through. The prophecies about his birth being in Bethlehem in Micah 5, 2, and, and him riding on a donkey, which took place. And, of course, the crucifixion and, you know, some of the Psalms. Uh, mm -hmm. So the prophecies about Jesus. Also, the prophecies that were within the Old Testament about um, what God was going to do with the nation that took place, the the uh, uh, the book of Daniel talked about the prophecies of the nations and the kingdoms that were to come, uh, and that those took place in history. So, and then archaeology, they said that there was nobody named Belteshazzar, which the Bible talks about in Daniel 5, uh, because there was no record of him, but archaeology has since dug up references to Belteshazzar, so we know the Bible is true. So all of those are supporting supporting realities to the uh, authenticity of Scripture. Do you think archaeology and, and science type things, like when people come out and say, well, <clears throat> maybe it's something like evolution versus creationism, do you think God is using science or archaeology or, or one of those, you know, any of those items as a tool to show us more, or do you think they are, you know, again, at, at odds with each other? Oh, no. They, well, sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't. Uh, uh, science will always prove God to be right. Now, there's a time sequence for that, but it will always prove God to be right. You know, they used to say the earth was flat many years ago. The Bible says in Isaiah 66, the earth is round. Okay, well, it took science to catch up with the fact the earth is not flat. The earth is round. So the science will always catch up to the Bible, but the Bible will always be ahead of science. Because after all, God created the world and the laws by which the world functions. Therefore, science is catching up to God. I know you're a big Dallas Cowboys fan, so I have to ask you the toughest question of the podcast so far. If you were the general manager of the team, what would you do to win the Super Bowl? What would I do to win the Super Bowl? Well, I would probably replace Jerry Jones as the general manager. <laughs> so I, 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 let him just be the owner, not the general manager. Um, I would... Uh, I wouldn't have traded some of the people that they've traded, but I know that there's a, there's a cap and they got to work through the numbers. Uh, so uh, a couple of things like that, but you know, I, I'm going to stick with them. Do you have a favorite uh, player on the team? I guess all time and then a favorite current player. Well, all time would be Roger Starback and right now would be Dak. Because I know both of them. So those are two good ones. <laughs> Dr. Evans, I have to give a shout out to your son, Jonathan, who has succeeded you as the Dallas Cowboys pastor, and Mike Wojcik, the former strength coach of the Dallas Cowboys and Syracuse University, and your assistant, Sylvia. Without each of them, 
I would not have had the absolute pleasure and privilege of speaking with you today. Thank you for your time, and I will see you Sunday. <laughs> I look forward to seeing you Sunday. God bless you richly, and uh, we're going we're gonna to pray for you right now. Dr. Evans. Father, okay, go, go, ahead, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Well, Father, thank you for Tim and Troy. Thank you for this time we were able to have together. I pray that you will cover him, that you will meet him at his deepest place, physically and emotionally and, most importantly, spiritually. Thank you for his son who walks by his side. And, Lord, we do not understand your ways. We do not understand all the whys, but we will trust you in the dark, even at midnight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Evans. I got one, one last quick question. Yes. So one of the things that's important we do this with this podcast is we don't want to make it just about ALS or disabilities or religion or sports. We try to have a really good uh, mix of people on. So one of the things we, we always ask people at the end is if you, who would you like to hear on the podcast or who would you recommend? Who's somebody that we should help tell their story or they should come share their short story with us. Hmm. And it could be from any, any walk of life. I would say Ramesh Richards. Ramesh Richards is a very brilliant uh, guy from India. Uh, you can look him up at Reach, R, and then another R E A C H, Reach International. And he has a lot to say personally as well as globally about what's happening in the world. Yeah, that's really interesting. That'd be great. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. God bless you. Take care. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com. <laughs>